Hi guys. Thank you for coming. This is our fourth um, guest speaker session. Today we have Dr. Felix Morales. He's the associate dean of the associate dean of admissions for the Texas Tech Medical School. Um, thank you all for coming. I hope you'll enjoy. You guys just let me know when it's time and I'll start talking. Or is it now the time? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen and see here. Bear with me for a second, folks. So sometimes I'm not the most technologically savvy person in the world. And can you all see that? Yes, yes. I see a, a thumbs up. Okay, awesome. So, and y'all see that as well, right? Okay. And so, let me see here. Okay. So, thank y'all for the pre-med scene. It's a really cool, I, I got a chance to peruse y'all's website. I'm very, very impressed. Uh, and so, um, I know I, I, I'm speaking to people from Texas A&M, and I believe from the website nationally and within Texas as well, from, from my understanding. So, Thank you all for allowing me to speak to you here tonight. And also thank you for the dedication level you guys have. And this is the night before Thanksgiving where many of y'all probably are probably smelling the, the food coming out of the kitchen being cooked and baked right now. So thank you all so much for having me here tonight. Um, as I was you know, presented, you know, I am the Associate Dean of Admissions for Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center School of Medicine. Uh, we're based out of Lubbock, Texas. I also have a dual uh, role. I'm an associate professor in our Department of Family and Community Medicine. Uh, so I ca I'm carry multiple hats for our School of Medicine here at Texas Tech. And, uh, and uh, you know, obviously uh, this, this topic is going to be mainly more about um, applying to medical school, making you a competitive applicant. Uh, it's kind of my standard presentation. Uh, and I apologize for the A&M folks if you've seen it beforehand, but I have updated some uh, material or some numbers into the presentation. But, uh, you know, one thing I'm not the quickest on is answering questions through the chat as I'm pre presenting this. So if you um, would reserve your questions at the very end, uh, I, I can hold a Q&A session for everyone. Uh, if there's a burning question, you just have to type it in the chat. I'll try to, I'll try to get to it as I come, go to it. But if you can wait till the very end, I, I really appreciate that. So tonight's topic is, you know, com uh, crafting a competitive application. You know, many of you all are obviously pre-med students, right? And, you know, you want to have some insight on how to, you know, develop a good comprehensive application, right? And in a sense, it is a competition. There's no way around, you know, stating that. If there's not anything, I'm very honest about this. And so, but I'm going to provide you guys some good uh, information and how you can go about in regards to becoming a competitive applicant. So tonight, let's see if I can go forward here. Uh, next. Uh, these are the objectives. I'm going to talk a little bit about the applicant pool itself and who you guys will be applying uh, against. Now, granted, uh, there might be people nationally in this in this call, and I'll have some information uh, regarding out-of-state applicants as well when it relates to applying to the state of Texas, and particularly our School of Medicine here at Texas Tech. Uh, I'll talk about the holistic review. Often, when I bring up the topic of a holistic review, I get often get some eye rolls in the audience, but we truly believe in the holistic review here at Texas Tech, and I'll explain to you the history behind it and what we do at Tech in regards to reviewing applications. Some common mistakes that students make time and time again, and how you overcome those mistakes in regards to before you're applying uh, some blemish metrics, you know, not everyone has a, a perfect, you know, 4.0 as you apply to medical school. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about overcoming those blemish metrics and, you know, things that we can do to enhance your application from the metric standpoint. I'll talk about the all very important interview, different formats. I'll give you some insight in how our, our format is set up here at Texas Tech. You know, the all important personal statement, and I'll we'll emphasize that tremendously at the end of this discussion. And at the very end, I'm going to summarize everything for you all so you, can, you guys can have a good sense of where, we're going to, where you should be at in a particular stage of learning, whether you're freshman through senior. 
So I'm going to move on, talk a little bit about the applicant pool. And this is from last year's data. This is from last year, the entry class that just started this past fall in August. Uh, when we took the total number of students, you know, it basically mirrors it year to year. And so essentially anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of the applicant pool coming into the state of Texas, those who apply directly through the TMDSAS, uh, the Texas Medical Dental Student Application Service, that is our application service provider. Uh, you know, anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of those students are going to be from an out-of-state applicant pool. When we look at the gender breakdown, uh, you know, for the last four years, we've had more females apply to medical school than males, and that's the, actually the national trend. Um, and so we, we've seen that time and time again, and I think that number is going to continue on this, this year. And in any given year, we're going to have about, there again, in year for 20 to 25 percent of that pool be reapplicants. you know, those students who, or applicants, I should say, that have uh, applied multiple times, you know, up to, you know, five times. And, uh, you know, and, and they're seasoned, they know what they've done, they've gone through advising sessions, they've gone through these types of sessions to hear information and feedback on their applications. So when we talk about just the raw numbers, you know, this is from last year, and I'll talk a little bit about this current pool that we just got raw numbers uh, from this year. Um, you know, for two years in a row, we've exceeded over 6,000 applications uh, for la going into last year. This year, historic numbers. Uh, we've exceeded 7,000 applications into the TMDSAS. Um, and our school in particular has shattered records of the number of applications we received. Uh, we are, are approaching 6,000 applications. Um, you know, so what was once, uh, I would say, an application-friendly state, you know, I had two roommates in medical school from California that purposely moved to Texas to establish residency to apply here. I think we're getting to that point where we're becoming more of a California picture, where it's going to be very, very competitive when it comes to applying. Now, when it comes to the numbers here, I'm going to throw a question out to the audience. And if you know the answer, by all means, just you know, shout it out to, for me, because I really I only see a few faces here on the screen. But in 2010, what happened here historically in the healthcare medicine realm? Um, you know, a lot of debate was occurred over this last uh, few months in the presidential debates. So what happened in 2010? So you wanna say anything? The Affordable Health Care Act got passed, right? Obamacare, right? And so when that happened, you know, there was this doom and gloom of saying, hey, no one's gonna to wanna to become a physician. No one's gonna, did the numbers bear that up? No, as you can see the trend, like I said, this year is over 7,000 applications. So why is this important? Well. From last year's group, from the 6,000 or so applications that came in through the TMDSCS, about anywhere from 2,500 to 2,700 of those students, almost half of that group, got interviews. And from that group that got interviews, about two-thirds of those students actually came into medical school. So for you on the audience, the goal should always be to try to get an interview. If you can get your foot in the door through an interview, you're, uh, the data will bear it out. You're putting yourself at a good position to get into one of the spots that's sponsored by the TMDSCS. Now, when we talk about just raw numbers and what we see here coming into Texas Tech, this is the data that we have and that we like to share. This is the group from this past year. The overall MCAT average was a 508, which is a little few more points higher than the national average. These are the GPAs, the overall GPA, and then the BCPM. Now, oftentimes students will ask, what's the BCPM? That's the biology, chemistry, physics, and math GPA, your science, your core science GPA. Or if you're from an out-of-state applicant pool, those numbers are skewed. They're going to be a little bit higher. Uh, MCAT hovers between 514. I've seen as high as 516 on an average. And overall GPAs are always going to be just a little bit higher. There's going to be a 3.9 and a 3.8 for that science component of that GPA. I'll get back to why this is important here in a little bit later. Now, when we talk about just removing people from the pool and those who came in, you know, the reason I had this slide made is partly because, you know, students will often come back and they'll tell me, hey, I knew someone who had like a 3.1 or 3.2 and got into medical school. Now, granted, there are a few that do come in. But as you can see, the majority of the students are going to have at least a 3.6 or higher as they apply to medical school for that overall and that science component of that GPA. Now, when we talk about just the MCAT in itself, there again, 
you know, people will come back and they'll tell me, hey, I knew someone had 499, they got into medical school. And granted, holistically, we look at every aspect of the application to see if you stand out. But traditionally, that kid who had that 499 is usually going to be that kid who has that perfect 4.0 GPA. So it's going to be kind of, this kind of balances each other out. When we talk about just majors in general, right? Uh, you know, people always say, what major should, should I be when I'm applying to medical school or when I come into an under, undergraduate uh, 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 coursework study, right? And these are the three most popular majors and they have not deviated for the last four years since I've been in this role. Uh, biology being number one, biochemistry being number two, and neuroscience being number three. Now, psychology has come very close to surpassing neuroscience as that third major. But do you have to be one of these majors? And the answer to that question is no. Um, you know, we accept all majors uh, to apply. We've accepted all majors that come into medical school. We've seen things anywhere from medical education to art history to theater uh, and a lot of engineering students. So, so if there's an engineering student in the audience, yeah, we've accepted engineering students. Also very uh, popular, also business and poli sci that we've seen as well come through. But these are the most popular majors. And we, like I said, we, we accept all applications. So when it comes to the schools that apply most to our um, um, uh, medical school, uh, this is the, the, the group out here. You know, uh, If there's any people, audience from, or UT, you guys give yourselves a clap or a round of applause. Uh, year in, year out, UT just by raw numbers has the most applicants to our school and also just to the TMDSCS in general. a and uh, you guys have hosted me many times and thank you for that. And for those who've established this group from a and Give you guys a round of applause. Every time you're in New York, out, Texas A&M tend to be that number two spot. Then followed by UT Dallas, Baylor University, University of Houston. Now, I'm, I'm a Texas Tech grad, undergrad in med school. And do you see Texas Tech on this, on, this, on this top five? We don't. Unfortunately, we don't get as many applications from our own whole uh, 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 medical school. But in, anyone in the audience can tell me who the sixth school is in regards to applying to Texas Tech annually. Does anyone want to venture a guess? I don't see anyone saying anything. I see some in the chat, so I'm gonna go to the chat room. Uh, um, see. Is it Texas Tech? No, actually I saw UTSA, TCU, no. Believe it or not, BYU, Brigham Young University out of Utah. Uh, we have a tremendous group of students applying from Utah uh, into, into Texas in particular. And, and most, and the, kind of the joke amongst the medical schools in Texas is that from your out of state applicant pool of students that come into your medical school, majority are probably going to be Utah residents or Utah grads of some sort, whether it be BYU, University of Utah, Weber State, those types of schools. So, anyhow, so yeah, BYU is always number six spot for us. So, so. As we talk about, oh, let me see, got stuck there. Let's see if I can get it forward. As we talk about applying to medical school, we talk about the holistic review. Now, I, I sit here before you as a representative of my medical school, and you know, I can only speak on our behalf. You know, I, we understand that certain medical schools are going to emphasize the, uh, areas a little bit differently. Uh, you know, we try as a school to try to look beyond numbers. We truly do. Because uh, we value students from varied and diverse experiences. Part of that is we know that when it comes to someone's medical education, this is going to have a positive impact not only on uh, your learning, and particularly in that third year is where diversity really sets in and, and how students are able to learn from each other. But we know at the very end of things that having a diverse group of students is also going to impact the health of future patients. Right? As we know, the studies show time and time again, the more diverse group of physicians you have, the better it's going to be in regards to impacting the life and the health of patients in the future. And we know that it's our goal to produce the best physician possible. So we try to emphasize the, 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 the stance of trying to educate our students at the very best. And that also includes including a group of varied, varied and diverse group of students. So when we talk about the holistic review and where does it come from, this is kind of the historical model that was established by the double AMC. Uh, the Association of, uh, excuse me, the American Association of Medical Colleges. We call it the Experiences, Attributes, and Metrics model. Uh, essentially, the EAM model, those life experiences that make you who you are as a person, you know, events in your life, your education, your personal attributes, where you grew up, 
basically your own personal DA, D, uh, DNA, who you are as a person. But at the core of any holistic review is metrics that that kind of produces that excellence that student who's we're going to try to uh, aim for. Now, when it comes to our holistic review at Texas Tech, these are the areas that we like to emphasize, and this is kind of our open book way of saying, "Hey, this is how we go about reviewing an application." Now, the first section that we like to look at is healthcare activities. Now, you know, in, in years past, prior to COVID, you know, pre-COVID. You know, what we would look for is shadowing. Now, we don't necessarily look for um, number of a certain number of hours. What we're looking for is quality over quantity. Now, granted, COVID has thrown a big monkey wrench into this portion of the application, partly because, you know, a lot of clinics and a lot of hospital-based systems are not allowing students to shadow. And granted, that's done to protect and for the safety of the students coming in. But there's other things like I was really happy to see in the website, you guys offer some virtual shadowing or some outlets for that. Um, you know, that's going to be a trend. Uh, I would kind of say the disclaimer I say about this is that we, as this medical school, I also think as our partners in the TMDS, TMD, TMDSAS know that, um, that for the next two years, we're going to see some decrease in the amount of shadowing that we like normally like to see. But you want to be creative though, right? You know, virtual shadowing is one avenue for that. Attending these types of sessions, or you could document that healthcare activity section. We're not going to bring you into an interview and quiz you on your medical knowledge. That's not the point of shadowing. The point of shadowing is to have you guys have an understanding of what you're getting yourself into, an understanding of the medical profession, right? So I've been advising a lot of students here recently in regards to the healthcare activity section. You know, try to build mentorship relationships with people you know who might be a physician, a PA, a nurse prac, you know, someone that you can kind of talk to and bounce ideas off of, right? And if you can demonstrate in your application, that's what's gonna help you out, okay? Um, you know, by no means, I like to say this too out loud, but I'm gonna say, you know, uh, scribing is another avenue that you could do that. But granted, I put a big asterisk on that statement saying that if it was my son, I probably would hold off on having them do any sort of uh, scribing just because I never want to put a person in a position where they're going to be exposed to COVID and COVID is pretty tough for respiratory illness to kind of come over. So, so just be very careful if you're going to do that, uh, that type of um, healthcare activity experience. Now, cervix experience is something that we always look for too. We're going to try to find that. We want to see how altruistic you are, how giving of a person are you now. We can always tell an application when students trying to do all the generic things, uh, Boys and Girls Club of America, um, Habitat for Humanity. Now, those are all great. Don't tell me wrong. Those are all great service opportunities. Uh, but, you know, we want you to be passionate about it. We want to see what, how creative you are in regards to giving back to your community. I always say, wherever you're at in college, you always want to leave that university or that college a better place than what it was before you got there. And can you demonstrate that in that service experience uh, section of the application? You know, I've gone as far as seeing Students have formed their own nonprofit organizations. You know, if you could do that, demonstrate that, that goes a long way in regards to how you would peer holistically on an application. I'm going to skip research and come back to here in a minute. Leadership is also very important. I'm very impressed with the students who developed this, this pre-med scene. Uh, you guys have done a wonderful job by doing that. Now, you know, not every person can go off and do uh, become a president or vice president of a student group, but you want to be actively involved if you can, right? You want to, you could be a treasurer, you could be a social chair, you can be a fundraising chair, some activity that kind of demonstrates who you are as a leader. You know, I sit here before you in this discussion as an introvert that's adapted to extroverted world of medicine, and medicine is a very extroverted world, right? So how can you demonstrate that? Well, we want leaders because oftentimes leaders are not only, not necessarily hey, be these vocal loud persons, but people are going to be able to communicate, you know, because communication is so critical in regards to medicine, right? I would say that a majority of students who get, I hate to use the word, kicked out of medical school is not necessarily a metric issue. It's always going to be some communication, some professionalism issue. So being a leader oftentimes, you know, uh, demonstrates your ability to adapt and communicate with people. Letters of recommendation are also very important. You know, I would say that um, uh, uh, a misconception out there is that they're not. Uh, I, just because I see, uh, uh, you know, Sneha on my screen, I'm going to use her as an example. So a bad letter for her would be, she showed up to my biochemistry class, top 5% student would do well in medical school. A great letter for, great letter for her is going to be, she showed up to my office hours. She and I had discussions about her dreams and aspirations of becoming a physician. 
these are the reasons why that she's going to be a good student. But more importantly, these are the reasons why she's going to be a successful physician. I'm hoping you guys can see the difference on that, right? That quality of that letter, making sure you're building those personal relationships with the people who are going to write letters recommendations for you are very, very, very critical. Now, I skipped over research. I'm going to come back to you right now. Now, we don't require research as a component for you to apply to medical school. There are times that students apply without any research, actually even get in without documenting the research. Now, as you guys have heard before, and I've had to mention before, over 7,000 applications, and oftentimes we're having to split hairs amongst all these applications. So the way I look at research is like icing on a cake or a cherry on top of a sundae. Now, both a cake and a sundae taste pretty good without the cherry or the icing, but if you have that on top of a cake or of a sundae, it's going to make it pop, right? It's going to make it look better. So the way I look at research is that cherry or that icing on the cake. If you can have some, it's going to make you stand out, okay? And then lastly, uh, I have gave you guys our raw data. I don't, I never lie about that numbers or anything of that sort, you know, and I mentioned GPA and MCAT as part of our holistic reviews. You guys look at that model, the EAM, EAM model. It's at the core of the holistic review, right? And so I never like misguiding a group of students on importance of metrics and numbers. Now, granted, you know, you have to have that four perfect 4.0. Do you have to have that 525 MCAT? The answer to that question is no. But to make yourself competitive, whatever medical school is in your dream and your heart's desire, you want to be in the ballpark, right? You want to explore what metrics they have, right? And if he could be within a few number, a few uh, a points of the MCAT, if he could be a few decimal points away from those GPAs, you're putting yourself in the ballpark. I'm a big baseball fan, right? So, you know, if you're within that range, you're sitting in the, in the stands in right field, right? If you're at that or above that, you're on the field. But at least try to be in the ballpark for us, right? Now, for the MCAT, if you are, um, uh, uh, I would say, aim for at least 50th percentile or higher on the four subsections, that that should put you at least at a 502, which puts you at the ballpark, at least for our school of medicine. So when we talk about some common mistakes. Uh, granted, for the younger people in the audience, and when you when you know post COVID, you know hopefully things will go a little bit better in regards to the application period. COVID, we had to extend the application period for students, but post COVID, I think we're going to go back to the traditional application period, which is May first to October first. Now. If there's one point to remember, if anything that I talk about here tonight is do not apply late in the cycle. And what I mean by that is the sweet spot to submit your application should be end of May to the maybe that first week of July. And when we look at the data time and time again, it follows the same curve. Those students who applied earlier got the interviews, and those who got the interviews got in the medical school. And less than one to 2% of students who apply in that last month of the application cycle will even, will not get an interview, you know? So, I mean, we'll, we'll get an interview. So if you're applying late in the cycle, you're putting yourself behind the eight ball, your application gets put on the bottom of that electronic pile. And it's really hard for any admission staff to try to get through all the applications before they get to you, okay? A view and submit is the finish line, meaning that once you turn in your application, you drop everything. I'm not research, I'm not doing any research, I'm not doing any community service. Don't do that because you'll be questioning what you're currently doing for your uh, university or wherever you're at in life uh, up until the point where you actually come into medical school. Taking the MCAT before you're fully prepared. There are a lot of tremendous resources out there. My best advice to any group of students is just do test questions, test questions, test questions in whatever format you can find, whether it be Khan Academy, Kaplan, Princeton Review, the double AMC has uh, a question bank or a full length examinations. And if you can get a, some full length exams underneath your belt before you apply, it does help you out because it's that the mental toughness that you have to have to go through that long, long examination. We found, you know, study one of our recruiters said anywhere from 300 to 500 hours of study time is what we would highly recommend. Um, and you could, you know, I would say if you're going to take the MCAT the semester up that when you're applying, you know, don't take it later than, than March and make sure you have a lighter load of, of classes that semester. Talking about timing of things, right? So failure to account for processing time. So make sure you know the deadlines and when you're supposed to apply. Make sure you know when you give deadlines for your letters or recommendation writers. Make sure you're doing all those types of things because you don't want your application to be delayed for any reason, right? Uh, you know, we're going to skip to the next bullet point. We talk about this comprehensive application. We're talking about the secondary app. We, uh, we require a secondary application to our School of Medicine. 
I think there's one school in Texas that through the TMD SCS that does not require that. I believe that's UTMB. I might be wrong on that, but I believe it's the UTMB. Now, the secondary application just kind of, you know, determine other, some additional attributes that we're looking for in applicants. Now, um, with that being said, we're not going to look at your application until we have the complete package, and that includes that secondary application. Apply before you have a comprehensive application, meaning that if you got, I showed you, shared you guys the, the whole secret review and how we approach it. I look at it as a way to scale, right? So if you have one area is a little bit weaker, make sure you're filling in the gaps with the other area, okay? And lastly, what we have at Texas is called the Texas House Bill 1508. This got passed like three years ago. And essentially, I'm not going to read the statement, but the paraphrase everything is, if you have something on your record, it might render you without the ability to get a medical license when you complete your training. And, you know, felony charge, hopefully not. You know, misdemeanor, not so much, but it's going to, hold, it's going to carry some weight on that. Now, you know, and, and, and the reason I bring this point up is because, you know, in, in, in my darkest days of taking organic chemistry, I remember I used to write my name, Felix Morales, MD. Felix Morales, MD, to remind myself that that was the goal at hand. I put placed that up on my wall to remind me of the sacrifices I was making to be able to achieve that goal. You guys are making sacrifices. You're literally here the night before Thanksgiving hearing me speak, right? So you don't want to do anything that's going to disrupt you guys. So I say this with all sincerity in my heart, and, and I, please don't be a knucklehead. <laughs> don't get into any trouble while you're an undergrad that's going to render your ability not to have your application looked at, okay? Now, we talk about overcoming those blemished metrics. Now, not everyone has the same high school opportunity. Some high schools we know are going to prepare the students better for undergraduate um, coursework than others, right? You know, we have a lot of students in this rural West Texas area that just don't have the advantages that students might have, say, and from, from Plano. I'm just throwing that out there. If you're from Plano, I apologize. Not By no means am I disparaging you, but you know, we know that there might be some students who just don't have the ability to have the science content in their high school high school training, right? So how do you overcome the blemish metrics, right? If you had that C in your Jenkins class when you came to undergraduate, right? But we always jokingly talk about our school, you know, strong MCAT score solves all bills, and, we, and it truly does, right? Uh, you know, when we talk about the MCAT, by no means is it going to be a predictor of how good of a physician you're going to be, but it might be a predictor of how well you're going to be able to handle the rigor of medical school. Uh, that BCPM, the science GPA, you know, often we see engineering students particularly has a tremendous tough coursework, right? But if your science GPA is within the average or higher beyond, beyond your overall, it does give us some reassurance. Yeah, this student can handle the rigor of medical school, right? Especially for those, you know, liberal arts majors, you know, those majors that aren't the biology, biochem, and neuroscience majors, we're gonna really focus in on that BCPM. Upward grade train, I'll talk about that here in a second. And lastly, if you're in that group of students in the audience that supply didn't get in, you know, uh, you're in that group that applied this year and you're, you're maybe not getting hearing back from interviews and you don't get in the cycle, don't give up, I always say. But look at post back programs, look at grad school programs. We have a wonderful program through our graduate school of biomedical sciences, which is kind of our neighbor in the School of Medicine. It's called the Graduate Medical Sciences degree. It's a two-year program. It's very similar to that of the North Texas program, but ours is two years. It's fantastic because not only does it, you take classes with the medical students, you're literally taking the gross anatomy, the BCT biology uh, of cells and tissues. You're taking these courses along with your med students, but you actually get an interview with the medical schools after into that second year with us and also Paul L. Foster, our sister school in El Paso. So it's a great program to think about. Now, when we talk about upward grade trend, you know, every medical school is going to want the student that just rocked it, you know, spent all the time in the library, their dorm room studying, and, you know, prepared for themselves to be able to apply, right? That student that came in with the 3940s type of GPA, right? But we see a lot this type of grade trend. A student that just had a little bit of a struggle initially, but they figured it out. They figured out how to study. They figured out how to manage their time. They, they buckled down. You know, they had that aspirational goal of becoming a physician. They put the blinders on to the world, right? And we like capturing students that come up to this point just because, you know, they, you know, they're in that upward trend. They're, you know, they're in that trend that they're going to figure things out when they come to medical school and they're going to take on that curriculum head on. What we don't like to see is this type of student. The student that had that rocky road through their graduate career, you know, and I always jokingly say, 
my dog went away from home. My girlfriend broke up with me. You know, you know what that shows is the student just isn't resilient, doesn't have that perseverance, right? Because medical school is going to be hard. You know, I'm not going to sugarcoat that, right? You know, what you learn in one year in high school is about a semester in college. What you learn in a semester in college is about one to two weeks in medical school. So the volume of information that comes at you is pretty fast and furious. So you want to make sure that you're prepared. And like I said, we love capturing students here or here, okay? So when we talk about the all-important interview. Now, you know, there are several types and formats, right? There's a blinded interview. There's one school in Texas that I know does a blinded interview. You show up to the interview, all they have is a picture in your name and you just gotta have an open conversation with that interviewer. What we have at Texas is called semi-blinded interview, meaning that our interviewers are blinded to metrics, GPA, and NCAP. Uh, now, what we can't do is we can't go through the entire application. Sometimes letter writers are very proud of the students and they uh, provide that information. We can't strike that out completely, but we do our very best to blind our interviewers because we don't want them to be biased on metrics. Now, there are all what we call multiple mini interviews, uh, MMIs. Uh, essentially, I call that like speed dating interviewing where you uh, go to a station, they'll ask you a question for, you have five minutes to answer that question, you jump to the next station. Uh, usually anywhere from six to 10 stations, depending on the school, right? Um, you know, it's a, it's a popular format. I've seen a lot of trends going towards that as well. Uh, there's panel interviews where uh, you're going to be in front of two or three uh, app, or excuse me, interviewers and it's going to pepper you with questions. And also keep in mind the length of the interview. If you're that introvert in the audience like I was, you want to be your very, very, very best. Be engaging, be communicative, be, you know, being able to speak to people for at least 20 minutes. Most interviews will not go beyond that. Sometimes it goes 30 minutes if it's a really good conversation, but it doesn't go beyond that. Now, in this COVID world, you know, we've done a lot of these type of interviews. We've done it through Zoom. We've established a really good Zoom format and how we can go about doing interviews in our school of medicine. My prediction would be that we're probably going to continue that in at least through the, this next fall, because although the vaccine is in the horizon, we just don't have a good sense of how quickly that's going to be distributed out. And you know, part of it's gonna be a safety issue. So we're gonna see how things roll out over the next spring. And be prepared to answer some tough questions, some situational behavioral questions. They're gonna put you in a, you know, a tough spot. My best friend stole questions from a chemistry exam, wanted to give them to me. What, what, what should, what, and we're put, what, do you, what would you do in that scenario? So do you be prepared. There's no right or wrong answer. I was, my best advice is to come up with the evidence-based answer, stick with it. And you know, don't try to perceive what the person's gonna to wanna to hear, okay? Uh, when it comes to import, importance of the personal statement, I always say this, and I always say it to any group of students, it's the very, 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 very first place I go when I review an application, because it's really the only place that's going to make you unique as an applicant. It gives you a chance to directly speak to people like myself and other people in the office, and also people, faculty members who are reviewing applications for us. Uh, poor execution can be unfavorable, can be disastrous, so make sure you're getting that thing proofread over and over again. Um, when it comes to the purpose of it, right, if there's one thing I always talk about is how committed you're going to be in achieving the goal of becoming a physician, right? So commitment level is very, very, very important. Uh, the, be strategic about things. Because there are going to be times in which uh, uh, an, an interviewer is going to get a lot of questions from your personal statement. So you want to make sure you're talking about the particular topics that you want to talk about, you feel comfortable talking about. Uh, it's clearly your own personal campaign. Now, when it comes to developing this, you know, what is your motivation? Was there an aha moment in your life that led you to that decision? But please, 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 please. I know I, this gets, I've read through thousands and, and I hate reading. I love science and I want to help people. We see that time and time. And now granted, if that's what's really led you, to, led you to that decision point in your life to become a physician, great. But can you write it without using those two statements, right? And one thing I've seen time and time again here recently is a summarization of, of, of your application. And once you're given all the the highlights, so, and we could get that from that question. We want to make sure it's a truly unique statement. The two being bread goals is what's motivated you and how committed you're going to be. So if you can remember that, motivation, dedication, motivation, dedication. If you can tell us that in a personal statement, it goes a long way. We're looking to see how passionate people are going to be about going into medical school. You know, if you had to persevere at all, we we'll won't put that in the application too. But as it comes down to for me is like, that personal statement means a lot, partly because if you can show me, you can demonstrate 
in particularly your level of dedication because you know I'm very proud of our school that we were able to graduate from 90, 94 to 96 percent all of our students that come in that first year will graduate within four to five years I always get wonder what happened to that four to six percent that didn't graduate were they just not motivated enough did that was that did I miss something on their personal statement so we want to make sure you know motivation and dedication how dedicated you're going to be in accomplishing the goal of becoming a physician now I'm almost done here folks and so we talk about myths in regards to applying to medical school. There were a few, a few years ago, I asked our, our uh, staff, hey, can you provide me a myth that, that would, you know, they would like to share? The first one came from our associate director and he goes, don't believe everything you read in Student Doctor Network. I know it's a popular website for pre-meds and apparently there's a blog or blogosphere type of situation. So don't believe everything you read there. Um, you know, this is for our tech students because I'm going to Texas Tech, that means I have an inside track and the answer to that question is no. We look at everything holistically, you guys stand on your own two feet. Um, my sister received an interview, but I haven't heard back from you school. So that means I'm, you guys are, no, no, there again, individually, we're looking at ED application individually. Uh, my mom and dad are Dr. So-and-so, that means I'm going to medical school. And the answer to that question is no. You have to stand on your own two feet. You have to stand on your own merits. I'm afraid to call or email because I don't want to be a bother. Now, granted, there's an appropriate way of doing this, you don't want to call every single day. You don't want to email every single day. Uh, I had one student one time email me this about every week, and it was you know questions like where do I go shadow? Where can I go to? And I'm like, these are things that you guys need to do on your own, right? I mean, you guys are young adults, young learners. You guys start doing these things on your own, okay? But you know, drop in the line. You know, if you heard me tonight and you want to email me a little bit later, hey. I enjoyed your talk. Remember, I'm so so. You know, you know, and it, that kind of helps. You know, plant the seed into my head, and particularly those in across the country, if they're doing these discussions. Now, in summary, you know, for those who are, now I know freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, it's kind of ambiguous nowadays. As a lot of kids come with AP credit and dual credit, but if you're in that first year of college, it doesn't hurt to start creating that roadmap. How do I get into medical school? Right. So start creating that roadmap. Start building relationships with people who you know are going to write you some quality letters of recommendation. Stay focused. Your, 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 your goal as a first year student should be grades, 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 grades. So, you know, find the library, find your spot, make sure you're doing the very best you can to put blinders onto the outside world, right? If you're a sophomore in that second year, reevaluate your grades. If you had a rough year, everyone in this audience has done taking algebra, right? So you can calculate. What do I need to do? What do I need to make to get my GPA on an upward trend, right? Reevaluate that, right? And see if you can do that. Uh, be active in your community if you can. Obviously, in COVID, it's put a monkey wrench, but there's a lot of online resources in which you could help out as well. I've seen people who have actually developed tutoring sites for and, and help, you know, people from disadvantaged backgrounds to get tutored. If you can do some shadowing, you can. Now, granted, we're still in the COVID um, uh, time frame. But if once COVID goes away, just try to be an active shadower. We Like I said, we just want to know, do you have an understanding of the medical profession? If you're in that third year and you're looking at applying this upcoming cycle, make sure you're preparing. I know we're about to enter that holiday season. I have a son who's a junior in high school. and I've been <laughs> had pulling teeth with that kid, but I want him to start preparing and taking the SAT test here coming up. So we're kind of developing a game plan for him. So it's hard to give him that game plan for the MCAT. Try to finalize those letter writers, right? Make sure you, you're reaching out to people who are, are going to write you some quality letters. And I showed you guys our holistic review, right? And so if there's some gaps or some deficits you perceive, you want to make sure you're filling in those gaps or deficits if at all possible. And if you're that person who's a last year student, didn't get in, you're in that cycle right now, didn't get in, um, don't, 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 don't give up. Always don't give up. If it is truly your heart's desire to be a physician, Reach out to offices like ours. You know, we do advising. We give you an honest assessment of your application or the uh, goal, what gaps were. Even if it meant, hey, you applied, you didn't submit your secondary application until the end of September, and that, and that and that's often something that does happen frequently. You know, be prepared to take the Casper test. All you need is a laptop. There's no way to study for it. We just say you got to take it. And if you're in that process of getting an interview. You know, just go through. There's I know career centers on campuses oftentimes have uh, the ability to provide mock interviews, uh, talking to other students you might know. You know, it doesn't hurt to get yourself prepared. If you have someone you build a mentorship relationship with, who's because a physician, 
maybe set them aside and, hey, can you ask me some questions about your interview day? What were, your, what were you asked? And then there again, if you didn't get in, reevaluate the competitiveness. As I said, we offer advising and start considering those post those grad school programs, okay? So, you know, at this point, I'm start taking questions. One of my favorite poets of all time is Robert Frost and, you know, two roads diverge in the wood and I took the one, let's travel by it. And I made all the difference. And, you know, you guys are in that path, right? You're going to take that one road, that path that no one's taken before in your life. If you have, don't have family members or physicians or anyone you can reach out, it is a path not taken. So make sure you're doing everything you can to, 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 to not deviate, to stay on that right path. And, kind of live life with a passion, termination of faith. That's always my personal motto. So anyhow, at this moment, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If I can figure this out, stop share here. And, and start taking questions from the audience. I'm seeing that the time is 7-11. And I don't know how long we have to take here, folks, but I'm here. I got this blocked off to 8 o'clock tonight. Now, granted, I might be a little bit late. But I'm here to take any questions you guys have. And and um, and I saw some things coming through the chat room. I didn't get a chance to look at those. Uh, Love your code, Dr. Morales. Very nice code. Yeah. OK, uh, well, um, let, let me just read a couple questions from the chat room, and then I'll start taking questions. Now, I know in the Zoom world, the participant, there's the hand. You could do that that way. Or if you physically, if you want to turn on your screen and put your hand up, I'll get to you as well. Um, so one first question is, uh, can you please, oh, let me see, I missed the question here. Get back here. Can you please touch, let's see, can you please touch one, what you're looking for and students, can you please touch on a problem? Can you please touch on what you're looking for students who, who have, who do special masters and have a low undergrad GPA? Uh, great question. So, um, you know, and, 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 and granted the purpose of, Sometimes students who have that low undergraduate GPA, it, the grad school program is the, it's a GPA booster, for lack of a better word, right? Now, um, the, 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 the goal, obviously, when we're looking at grad school program is the upper grade turn, right? Because I've found grad school programs are going to be tougher in the coursework that they're taking. So if you have an upper grade trend, in other words, if you're rocking all A's in that grad school program, that's what we look for because that gives us reassurance, hey, you figured things out. You can handle the rigor of medical school. Um, so that's what we're looking for in regards to that particular group. The other thing we look for too is, I hate to say this, more of a science-based uh, grad school program. You know, um, you know, don't get me wrong. There, there is a certain value to an MBA or a Master of Public Health. Don't get me, I don't want to devalue those master's programs. But, you know, how, how honestly, how much is that going to help you out with gross anatomy, with biochemistry, you know? And so you want to make sure you're taking those science-based type of growth programs if you can. Uh, second question here, when writing the personal statement, is it okay to briefly discuss our interests for a certain specialty? And the answer to your question is, yeah. You know, and one of the business misconceptions that we have, at our medical school, you know, we're, we're in West Texas, you know, our mission is to try to get physicians to the rural areas, not only in the state, but, you know, not in West Texas, but in the state. But ultimately, uh, as I say, the business can say, all we want to do is train family medicine physicians. That's so far from the truth. We're here to facilitate whatever dream you have. You know, I've written letters of recommendation from, for, for kids who've gone into diagnostic radiology to anesthesia to orthopedics. You know, I've, I've done it all. I've done the full, full spectrum of specialty now. Uh, but I would say this, if you had some experiences with that, whether it be personal, like I see a lot of that in a personal statement, whether it be I had a football injury, a soccer injury, an orthopedic surgeon just opened my eyes to the wonderment of, of medicine to, you know, I've had, you know, a bad uh, skin rash, dermatology. So we've seen it all. So if you can kind of relate it back to why you want to choose that specialty, yeah, by all means, by all means. Um, third question here. Uh, any advice for non-traditional career changing students? I hear a lot that is looked down upon you take classes at community college as opposed to going back to four years. Ah, that's a tough one. Now, I would say this um, for the non-traditional grads. Um, I, we're very non-traditional grad friendly in our school. Um, you know, I think we we tend to attract not a lot of non-traditional grads to apply to our medical school now. 
Um, you just got to make sure that you're really clear on why you want to pursue medicine and why you didn't do it earlier. And, and sometimes it might be because the lack of opportunity we've seen uh, women particularly, you know, got married right out of college, they became moms, you know, they always had the deep desire of becoming a physician. And then they go back and they apply and they get in eventually, right? Um, but the thing is, when it comes to the community college, now, it depends on, on other things, right? So for example, if your undergraduate GPA was still pretty strong, you know, um, in, uh, in, we're, in particular the science prerequisite coursework, it, it's not that we won't look, we not look down upon it, but oftentimes the four-year institutions often provide a little bit more of a rigorous approach to teaching and testing you versus the community college. So it's not so much that we're looking down upon a community college. We understand too the financial aspects of this is also pretty critical, but sometimes it's a little bit more rigorous. So if you're that non-traditional grad, maybe look at non-degree seeking courses from a four-year college if you're near one. That'd be my recommendation. Now, if you can't get to that, don't burden yourself by paying the extra money for that. But if, if that's the only option, we're not going to look down upon it. But you want to make sure you're, you know, in an essay somewhere in Africa, you're going to have plenty of opportunity to do that. Tell us why you, you chose that route. Um, are international students accepted at Texas Tech? If so, how competitive is it to get in in terms of other applicants? Unfortunately, for those our international students, um, it, we, we're partners with the TMBSCS, and so all the schools here, we do not accept international students. Now, there are some very, very, very extreme, rare occasions in which we do accept one, but usually those students have already been American citizens. They have some sort of connection to the school, that type of situation. But if you're an international student, yeah, the the any student that applies through the TMBSCS, you have to be an American citizen or a permanent resident of the United States. Uh, you have to take at least 90 hours of college credit from an accredited university or college in the United States. Um, and, and part of that, it comes down to licensing. So if we go back and we train an international student, they graduate, it's going to be very hard for your residency program to pick them up because at the end of it all, you had to get your medical license from somewhere. And if, you, if you're not a citizen of this country, you're not going to be able to get that. So if you're an international student, know the kind of the criteria I gave you. Part of it is not so much that we discriminate. Part of it is just we want to make sure that you're going to be able to get a license somewhere, and particularly in Texas, hopefully. And so that's the reason why it's difficult for international students to apply. Um, hi, Dr. Mills. I would love to ask my question when it is my turn. This is Sarah Rashid. Hi, uh Yes. Hi, Dr. Morales. Um, so my name is Sarah and uh, I'm from California, California mm -hmm. resident. Yes. And, and um, I'm also a non, I know you touched up upon uh, like non-traditional students and yes. I've been doing post-bac classes, um, but at my, um, I'm from UCLA. So I did my post-bac classes at UCLA Extension. And I was wondering uh, in terms of, I saw the stats um, that for out of the state applicants, you're looking for higher um, stats. So I was wondering um, how much, how much the stats from out of state play a role, and um, how much do you look at the post back GPA if you have done like more than forty units uh, with the straight A's? Um. So so Sarah, great question. Um. We truly like so we truly look beyond numbers, but I, the reason it, we're not the, so the metrics I showed you in particular for that out of state applicant pool it aren't the metrics that we're looking for. But when we when we just fish out the data from the out of state applicant pool, those are what the numbers bear out, right? So we're not looking that. So we've had, believe it or not, we've had an out of state applicant with an MCAT of 507, 508 come in because the rest of the application was just outstanding, right? And, mm -hmm. and so holistically, we're looking for that type of applicant. But to make yourself competitive, try to be in that ballpark if you can. Now, granted, I know sometimes the MCAT part of it can be difficult, but if you're in that post bat program and you've made all A's and you've had 40 hours of A's, that's just going to lift up whatever GPA you have. Now, one thing that you also kind of keep in mind with the GPA and the grad school program is, there again, everyone's in algebra, right? So if you had 150 hours of college credit, how much of that, how much is that needle point going to move if you do more hours, right? But if we can yeah. demonstrate on the transcript that you have, was 
because the, the cool thing about the TMD SES is they break it down. They, they show you the gray trend. And, uh, and if we can see that gray trend, you know, that's going to make you stand out for sure. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. And my yeah. last question was, um, do you have any preferences over um, a formal post-bag or master's program versus like do it your own post-bag? We, no, we don't. We don't. You know, I mean, I, I know I mentioned our, our grad school program and part of that is because we have a partnership with them, um, but we don't necessarily um, have one preference or the other, but by, by no means. Okay. So, okay. okay, thank you All so right. much. No worries. And so uh, Isabella Castellano would like to ask a question when it's her, her turn. Yeah, hi, I'm Isabella. I'm an undergraduate at UCF and I had a question regarding healthcare activities actually. Yes. So I know you discussed being creative, documenting what you have, building relationships. Um, one thing you mentioned that I was interested in was taking record of discussions such as these that are posted, especially during these COVID times. How exactly would you incorporate that into your application or CV? Because I've been doing a lot of these recently since I'm you know, sitting at home and yeah. um, I don't want to make it too crowded, but I just want to maybe understand how to incorporate it without making it too heavy. I don't know. Well, you know, great question. Now, the good news is uh, our, uh, and when you apply, hopefully you apply to TMDSS, there's a wonderful application. It's, probably, it's cheaper than the AMCAST. One application fee gets distributed to all the medical schools. And, and that might, and before I answer your question, if you're applying through the TMDSS, something that we get a lot from our schools, oh, you guys weren't on our radar. No, every school in the TMDSS should be on your radar because one application fee gets distributed out to all the schools. Now, to answer your question specifically, the application itself is broken down very succinctly in regards to the areas that you need to put in, right? Now, oftentimes what occurs, and particularly, you know, sometimes same things can overlap, you know, scribing, is that employment? Or is that healthcare related? You know, if you get a paycheck, most likely it's going to put that in the employment, but you see that scribing, okay, that that's going to be something that can, we look at as a healthcare related activity. Uh, so the good news is the application is already broken down for you, where you're not going to have to worry about overwhelming one section or the other. Now, um, when it comes to this COVID time frame, uh, you know, there's going to be descriptors when you document uh, an, an activity. You know, I would always say for this moving forward, for the guy, for the people in this audience who are applying, you know, preface it by saying, unfortunately, due to COVID, I had to do this activity. And also the application itself are going to give you some unique experiences. You know, there's, there's an essay about unique experiences. You know, this you're in a pandemic, folks, right? We're in a pandemic, right? So it's a unique experience. So write that in your essay, right? And we also have our secondary application. We even actually a question about road hurdles and road bumps and things you have to overcome. You guys are having to overcome this right now. So document the reasons why you don't have certain areas, you know, a little bit more than others. So this is, that's where we would see that, that, that type of answers for your question. Hopefully I'm answering your question there, Isabella. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. And no thanks worries. for speaking. It was wonderful. No, I appreciate you. Thank you. So the next question I have, and apologize for scrolling down here. From Shivani, uh, what is campus life uh, at the medical school like? Um, I would say this now, um, and from, I think it was Sarah from UCLA. We have, we have uh, every year we have, always have two or three students from UCLA. So, and also from Cali, we also have a lot of students from California come and apply. Uh, we have a course called P3. It's kind of like our house system at Texas Tech where you get to like 10, a group of 10, 12 students. Inevitably, I always have someone from California young man who's uh, a third year student now, he's uh, from USC. Um, and so, so campus life is really great. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna speak very honest and very bluntly about our school, right? So um, one of the things that every medical school you go to is gonna provide a great medical education, right? And I'll get a little bit more, if you have questions about curriculum, I can get to that as well. But one thing that I always talk about our medical school and who we are at our core, our core values, right? And if you come from an interview, you're going to probably hear me say this time and time again, right? You know, we know as an institution that we cannot compete with the uh, amount of money that comes into research, like for Southwestern or Baylor College of Medicine. We know we can't compete there. So what we do as a school is we try to reinvest the funds and the monies that we have back to you guys. So you're going to get a top quality medical education. We're going to train you to be the best physician possible, right? 
we provide all resources possible. And this is kind of speaks to the core of who we are. Um, our dean of our medical school, my boss, a few years ago, found out about all these different online resources that our students were getting to prepare themselves for step one and step two. Kind of find out a lot of the more wealthier kids were being able to afford it. The kids who were disadvantaged couldn't. He didn't couldn't have that. So he writes a check of about a million dollars every year so our students are able to have all the resources possible at their fingertips, right? And so that kind of speaks to who we are as a student. Our campus life, we are a family at Texas Tech. We are a collegial environment at Texas Tech. You hear a lot about the cutthroat nature of medical school uh, 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 across the country. Right? And sometimes it can be ultra competitive. And our process and my process in regards to looking at applicants, if you have any sense of that demonstration of being that type of student, you're not gonna get invited to our school. We want students working together uh, together, not against each other, in the pursuit of becoming a physician, okay? And our students do a wonderful job. So we are truly at the core of who we are. Our campus life, we are a family at Texas Tech. We have that collegial environment. That's who we are at our core. If you want to come to that environment, we accept you. Apply to us, because that's who we are, uh, because we want students working together, like I said. And that's what's brought me back. As a student, I had options. I had options in regards to, to, to interviews and where I wanted to go. I had options to go to residency. I had options even to go become a faculty. But I chose to come to Texas Tech because of the core values that we live by each and every day. So anyway, yeah, that's how our campus life is. Um, as Texas Tech a medical school for MD or DO degree, uh, we are an allopathic medical school, so we will give you an MD. Now, um, we do have one school in the TMDSCS that's a, a, a osteopathic. That's the TCOM. That's Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine in North Texas. It's a great school. I not, never disparage any DL school. Um, uh, wonderful in training our physicians. I actually part of my job there again as a family medicine uh, physician and my chairman of our family medicine department. My other boss uh, is a DO. And so DLs are wonderful in regards to training and also providing uh, care for patients. So, but we are an allopathic medical school. We give you an MD. All right. This is from Sage Brewer. Uh, how much time should be spent searching for programs of interest and corresponding scholarships? Further, how much time should one expect to spend com uh, completing an all scholarship and program application? So we have one scholarship application. We kind of streamline that process for the students who apply to our medical school, who eventually get accepted. Uh, once you get accepted to our medical school and you're that 180 students, our, our office of admissions then will turn, turn, uh, turn around and uh, have you uh, fill out one application in which that application is used to see if you qualify for all the various scholarships our institution has. I will say this in regards to um, uh, our programs, there are certain programs that we offer full tuition scholarships. You know, if you are pursuing an MD PhD program, that full tuition, full cost of living scholarship. Uh, we have what's called a family medicine accelerated trap program. If you're interested in primary care specifically in family medicine, it's called the FMET program. We're the first in the country to develop a program to graduate medical students in three years with half the loan debt cost because you get a fully uh, tuition, full, a full tuition scholarship for the second year of the program. So we have various uh, scholarships. How do I know this? Well, you're talking to the chairman of the scholarship committee for our medical school. So I know all the ins and outs. We are ranked number one for tuition, uh, for in-state tuition by US News and World Report. Uh, uh, and we're at number one for out-of-state tuition. For those who are applying to our medical school from an out-of-state school, uh, you don't have to pay in-state tuition because you automatically get a small scholarship, which then in turn converts your tuition cost to in-state tuition. So you're paying, uh, you're saving a tremendous amount of money. Uh, also the cost of living in Lubbock, Texas and the surrounding campus, this is that we have in Amarillo and the Premier Basin are very, uh, the cost is very cheap compared to the national uh, levels, even within Texas. In some cities in Texas are at least 10 to 15% higher than the national average. We're always going to be running about 10% lower. So we're saving a lot of money by coming to our medical school. All right, great question. Hopefully I answered that question for you, Sage. Um, next question uh, is from Patricia Viney. Uh, and say, thank you so much for elaborating, Dr. Morales. I heard that I cut down a lot. I'm just afraid. This is happy here. Okay, thank you. So yeah, no, we, and I said, this is not, by all means, this is something that we put in a billboard or put it on a screen or measure. This is who we are. And you're speaking directly from our medical school. That's who we are. That's our true core values. 
Um, let me see here. Uh, from Samira, since Texas school, Texas law requires that no more than 10% of United States to enter medical, is it so? Yes, it is. Um, the three states that we got, I see there's a couple of people from California. There again, Utah, California, Florida, New York, probably number four or five are the states that we see the most applications come in from an out-of-state applicant pool. I will tell you this, we have the 90-10 rule in Texas. You are correct. 10% of our class cannot be more from an out-of-state applicant pool. So if you do the math, 18 of the spots for a medical school are going to be from that out-of-state applicant pool. But we try our very best to hold those 18 spots because we know that uh, being from an out-of-state school, it adds value. It goes back to what I was talking about the holistic review, that diverse experiences, that diverse backgrounds. It adds value to our medical school. So please don't, don't. and plus, like I said, um, I can't speak, I know the AMCAS is a little bit more expensive when it comes to, it's a very, you know, our, our and then we actually even have, you know, our, the secondary app is where you probably need to pay a little extra money to be able to apply. But most of the secondary app application fees for all the medical schools in Texas are relatively uh, not too bad. And if you can't afford it, we have application fee waivers as well. As far as dual degrees, such as the MD, this is from Suhas. Uh, Suhas actually was communicating with me a little bit earlier. From Suhas, I see his face right there. He's smiling right there. Uh, as far as dual degrees, such as the MD, MBA, how does the application process work for Texas? So great question. Uh, and so when you apply through the TMDSCS application and you select Texas Tech, you'll be prompted to a screen in which you'll have all our multiple dual degree programs. Very proud of the fact that we've now tied A&M and uh, for the most dual degree programs uh, for any medical school, we're actually developing a master's of engineering program, bioengineering. And so it's going to be MB slash bio, uh, master of bio. So if you're an engineer in the audience, we're going to have that for you guys. Now, uh, but in regards to the, so you, you basically check off that box. Um, and that gets sent back to us. In our, and when we, that application gets transmitted to us. You get, um, now, we also, if you forgot to check it for whatever reason, our secondary application will also ask you, do you want to apply to a dual degree program? You get prompted a second time. And so, um, so, so there's two ways of doing that. We prefer to interview those students the day of your interview, meaning that you get two traditional interviews for the MD side of things. If you want to apply, now I'll talk about the MBA specifically here in, here in Minnesota, but for the FMAP program, you get a third interview. For the MPH program, you get a third interview. For the PhD program, you get actually two more interviews. You get four altogether. Um, we actually have an MBJD program, uh, which if you want to become a lawyer and a physician, you, you, but you have to be independently accepted by the law school. Um, so the, the process is uh, you get that. And so they, they meet, uh, and then the engineering side is going to have their own committee. They meet, they figure, okay, this is the people we want. Does it match up with the MB side? And then that's what we offer for those specific programs. Now, uh, when it comes to the MBA, a little bit different. Um, we used to have someone who would interview for us, uh, but he retired. So what the, what the new dean of the, the business school or the College of Business of Texas Tech did is say, hey, we trust you guys to select those students. And so you only get the two traditional interviews. Then we look at other things in your application that says, okay, this is the why the student wants to be an MBA, a good MBA. There's some business courses they take. And you have to kind of demonstrate why you want to do that. And then we provide that list to the MBA folks and say, this is what we think is going to qualify. Now, the MBA program specifically is our oldest and dearest dual degree program that we have. Um, you know, we, we can't take up to 18 spots, but later on in that program, I think the school, the medical school or the uh, master's of business program would like that more, but we can't more, they can't do more than 10%. We usually hover about 12 to 15 uh, students per that program. It's a great program. It's, uh, it's not your general MBA. It's a healthcare organization uh, management program. So it's specific for what you're going to want to see later on in life. And it's also a great program for, um, uh, interprofessional development. You'll get a chance to work with PharmD students and also uh, healthcare administrative students as well. So great question. Thank you, Suhas. Um, Thank you, Dr. No worries. So let me see here. And I see some coming through. Let me get back to... So that's dual degree. So this is from uh, Amelia. Is it Melancon? I can't... Uh, did I pronounce that correct? Melancon, Dr. Melancon. Okay. Yeah. There was, I'm a big baseball play, a fan, and the, my favorite team is the Atlanta Braves, and their uh, relief pitcher, their closer, was had your same last name, so I saw that. Yeah, and so anyhow, so what is the time in regards to secondary? So, um, so what happens is once you transmit your primary application, the TMDSCS is going to go through and do their verification process. 
uh, they're going to get that application. They transmit it then to the school so that you want that, that application to be sent. Uh, once we receive it in our inbox, our program analysts will just verify a few things. Literally, the day, the next day, you will receive an uh, invitation to complete the secondary app. Um, and so you want to make sure you're, you're submitting that in a timely manner. Uh, the deadline to submit is a little bit, it's like two weeks after the deadline to submit the overall primary application. I do not advise you waiting that long to submit it. Um, but what we've done to streamline the process is if you go to our website and you navigate through that, we've actually literally posted the secondary app application questions on our website. So you've access to those, so you can start typing them up and you can start populating that those answers uh, fairly quickly. So we want to make sure that you have that in your fingertips so we can make sure that you are, are applying in a timely manner. My best advice is once you receive that, that um, as, uh, invite, complete that as, as quickly as possible, okay? All right, so let me see, here's, uh, from Christina Castagnon. I'm probably pronouncing that right, Christina. Or uh, Christina. Yes, you are. Okay, um, I've heard that some people become EMTs. I'm just wondering if you'd recommend doing this. You know, I've seen that as a trend. Um, I, I don't necessarily have a recommendation one way or the other. I know that there's students from Rice University. Apparently Rice University has like a uh, EMT program, you know. Uh, but I've seen it as a trend. Um, it's a great way, I think, to demonstrate your interest in regards to applying to medical school. If you have the time to do it, uh, then I would say go for it, you know. But um, but um, yeah, it, would, it wouldn't be a, a bad idea, but there, cause it's no pressure on doing that either. But like I said, I've seen that as a trend for sure. Uh, back from to Sarah, would it be possible to have your contact information? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll put it in, my, in the chat room here in a minute uh, before I get off. I'll put my, my direct email. Now, the best way, honestly, if you go to our website, uh, there's a Texas Tech School of Medicine inbox email and, and our office coordinator, Jeff Vera does a wonderful job. He'll streamline uh, emails back to me. He'll review them and say, Dr. Matt, these are the ones that came in. So if you go to that website, you should see um, uh, that, that email inbox there as well. Uh, before I get off, I'll, I'll put my email directly into the chat room uh, before I get off. Just remind me to do that. Sometimes I'm forgetful about those things. Uh, this is from Ana Delgado. Uh, thank you for tonight's session. Oh, thank you, Ana. Unfortunately, I have to go. Truly appreciate the insight I've gained. I'll say safe. No, stay safe to you guys as well. Uh, from Yaliza, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly as well. Uh, would, you, would you recommend someone with a low GPA to take the MCAT and apply or for them to do a master's show improvement? Mm. Depends on how low the GPA is, very honestly. Now, um, I'm going to throw numbers out, but no means I'm making assumptions. Now, if you're in a low threes, yeah, definitely probably need to do something to get that GPA up, okay? Whether it be a master's program, doing something like that, right? Demonstrating your ability to have that upper grade trend. Um, you definitely, if you're in the twos, high twos, 2829, you definitely need to do a program uh, before. And then just buckle down and do the very best you can to prepare for that MCAT, okay? Um, let me see here from Cy or, uh, Karsh. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly as well. Uh, is it... Is it still hard to get into a U.S. medical school if a student is going through the process of becoming a resident in a time of applying? Yeah, I, I, I hate to say this. Um, I, I think, um, or would you still, yeah, you would still consider them internationally. We're not, and, and that's not our rule. Um, what the TMDSCS is going to do is they're going to ask, even for people who are thinking, say, hey, I'm at, you know, I'm going to throw, I'm at Stanford University, but I'm a Texas resident, but I lived in California for two years. That might even put you at a bad spot if you're not Texas resident. So even they even verify Texas residency. If you go to their website, uh, so I hope I'm pronouncing the correct site, they have the criteria for you, uh, the TMDSCS. It's, and I'll, I'll put that in the chat room too, but they have the criteria uh, for um, Texas residency, for you know, you know, residency status in general. Um, my, my best recommendation, if you can, is to try to uh, become a permanent resident before you do apply because it's going to be very difficult for those schools to look at your application. Um, so Isabella has another question. Uh, if there's time, I believe we have time. So for the pre-med scene folks, uh, Snake House, Sukhas, am I doing good with time? Yeah, okay. 
And so go ahead, Isabella. Fantastic, thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier some different dual programs, including MD-PhD, and honestly, that piqued my interest. I've been interested in it for a couple of years, but I've heard some very polarized opinions on it. Yeah. And I was wondering, in your opinion, um, as someone who's like in, involved in medical school applications or viewing them, what do you look for in an MD-PhD student? And what would you say is you would caution students against who are interested, for example, like what, um, oh, if you're interested in this or if you're more focused on this, don't do MD-PhD because I've heard a lot of people say, oh, don't do it, don't do it. No, no, it's a great question. Now you have to have a, a, a strong, strong passion for research and particularly medical research or biomedical research or some sort of natural science type of research, right? So that's first and foremost. I know I talked about research and that, that, that being a requirement when you apply to our medical school or to any medical school in Texas, but if you're applying to an MD, PhD program, you definitely need to demonstrate research in your application. Hopefully you've had your name published with some you know, literature. Hopefully you've had some poster presentations because that part of it is going to come back because uh, we want to make sure that that student has that deep passion to do uh, either bench research, clinical, some form of research, right? So you want to make sure you have that demonstrated in your application. So that's going to definitely make you stand out. Uh, in regards to the path, it depends on the student, right? I mean, I, like I said, the first P3 group, that class I was talking about, I had two MD, PhD students in my group. One of them eventually actually came back after seven years of graduate. He came back and he asked me, and he's actually on track to graduate from internal medicine and to become a cardiologist. Very, very proud of that young man. And, and so part of it is just how, how passionate you are about research and if you want to pursue that. Now, it's a great program that we have. And I think most schools of, um, in Texas have the same format. Um, it, uh, it's a, uh, we have what's called three phases of medical school training. We have our preclinical phase, which is like 20 months of the, you know, learning the science of medicine. You get done with that phase. And then instead of jumping into the clerkship clinical phase, then you jump into your PhD work. You'll do anywhere from three to four year, three years of PhD work. And then once you complete that and you, you know, you, you come, you literally become a PhD before you come an MD. You jump back into the clinical side of things and you complete the medical school. So it's about seven to eight years in length. Now it seems long and daunting, but trust me, you know, it, it goes by pretty quickly. Um, the great thing about the program, which I think is very similar to other schools in Texas, is that uh, you get a full tuition scholarship um, and you get a full uh, cost of living scholarship. So I always like to jokingly say that you're we're paying you to come to school, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And so, so you have to have, like I said, number one, have a deep passion for research, have it demonstrated in the application, hopefully you have something that's published. And then if you're, like I said, for me, I don't ever want to discourage anyone um, about doing this. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to do that, it, it just adds value at the end of the things for you, because as you're looking at, you know, specifically more for the really subspecialized fellowship programs, and you have research that kind of ties that into that, it helps you out. Okay. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. No worries. No worries. Uh, so Elisa, thank you. I did pronounce your name correctly. All right. Fantastic. So Samira, uh, what has been the students' feedback on the FIT program? Sounds interesting, but uh, seems intense. Uh, so it's a great. It's been all fantastic feedback. Now, um, now I'm biased um, before you as a board certified family medicine physician. So I'm very proud of the program, but I'm very, very proud of the program. Uh, you have to have a, a really deep desire to do primary care, specifically family medicine, right? And so when it comes to applying that program, like as I was talking to Isabella about the PhD program, you need to have to demonstrate some sense of why you want to become a family medicine, whether it be you grew up in a rural town, you've shadowed physicians, your mentor has been family medicine docs, those types of things are going to make it stand out. Uh, so the students that completed the program, uh, you know, they, they, you know, I talked to one a couple of years ago. He's actually now practicing in a small town about 30 miles south of Lubbock, Texas, called Tahoka. And I asked him, did you have any regrets? He goes, no, I don't. He goes, it was hard when I made that transition from med school to residency because you don't have a break between that. But looking back, Dr. Morales, I would have not chosen a different route. And so part of it is that um, it, it gets compressed. Uh, so what we do is we take a clerkship of family medicine and kind of have you do that new, longitudinally throughout your second year. The beauty of the program is you get done quicker. 
to get to places you need that need you the most, whether it be an inner city somewhere, whether it be a rural area, whether it be an under city, it gets you to those places quicker. Um, it's a wonderful program. A lot of our fac a lot of our um, graduates actually, two or three of them actually become faculty members, co-faculty members with me. Um, so I, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic program. So if you're interested in the FMAT program for sure, and at Family Med specifically, I, I, I would highly recommend it. I wish we had it when I was going through medical school. Um, do medical schools like to see military? This is back from the media. I answer you, yeah. So we're very friendly. I a and &M, I know is very friendly to uh, to those vets. Uh, we 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 try to spot holistically. We we love seeing vets because they add value. They add leadership to our school. Um, so it's very. I'm very proud of the fact that we're very friendly to that. Um, you know, if you're interested in continuing your military research or military service, uh, there's the, uh, the Health Profession Scholarship Program. There's also, um, which is awesome, because every year on uh, the graduation, it just brings me chills to my body when I see the, the people who uh, are going to serve and you know, makes them stand up and every, inevitably everyone gives them a, a standing ovation. And um, to be able to do both is fantastic. So uh, so yeah, so uh, if he had some military service, yeah, you know, we love seeing that for sure. All right, uh, let me see here. Uh, one came through, does the research you complete have to be in one area or can be, it can be varied. And a question I got the other day through email was um, a young man who is applying to med school is, uh, uh, does the research need to be science-based? It can be humanities-based and, and, and yeah, it, it doesn't have, if it's, now, going back to the specific question uh, that Isabella posed, it would probably need to be more science-based if you're applying to the MD-PhD program. But any research is research. Engineering students will have some research underneath their belt. So, like, again, it doesn't have to be specific to one area. Like, it's not necessary. Not necessary. But it's the cherry on top of the sundae. It's the icing on the cake. So if you can get some on there, it does make it pop. Okay. All right, I think that might be the last one. So let me see here. Actually, I got, oh, so thank you, Hasten. thank you. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, folks, is uh, I wanna say, I don't know the, the, the URL for the TMDSS, but I'm gonna type in, if you Google this, um, Texas Medical, open here, and the, the Google, uh, ah. I have all the information and criteria for those out-of-state applicants and for those international students um, in regards to it. The, the wonderful partners of ours, uh, the staff in that group, they do such a wonderful job. Their, their executive director, Matthew Meeks, is a wonderful person as well. So they're there to help and serve you guys. Um, they do a very good job in regards to it. So that's, that's the first thing here. That's If you have an opportunity to Google that, I don't have the URL memorized, but if you can Google that, as all the information you have on, in regards to the, uh, my personal contact information, I'm gonna put in my personal email, but there again, I'll be, fair warning, like I said, I received tremendous amount of emails. If you wanna directly email me to thank me for tonight, great, that'd be fantastic, I get those a lot. Um, but um, it, it, uh, emailing our inbox, our Texas Tech School of Medicine inbox, our, school, our office admissions inbox, Jeff does a wonderful job of filtering things out. He sometimes answers questions back if it's something he knows. Otherwise, he'll get it back to me. Uh, so, but my personal email is going to be in the chat room right there. Um, and I believe, I think that might be the last of the questions. So, um, unless there's not anything else in the audience. So, anyhow, I'm going to say one few, few, few last words here. I just want to thank uh, the, the pre-med scene. You guys, it's awesome. I really am impressed for what you guys have done, the service you've provided. Uh, I'm impressed that we brought people in from California internationally. It's just very, very impressive. I, um, as a student, I, uh, undergrad student years ago, I created a own, my own pre-med society at Texas Tech that still is the longest pre-med society. I'm very proud of that. The Bernard Harris Pre-Med Society is still ongoing at Texas Tech. Then you guys, what you guys hopefully can have legs and can last, uh, outlast you guys. And that's my goal for that Pre-Med Society. So thank you guys for inviting me. Um, everyone, please stay safe uh, during this pandemic. Uh, I'm a big advocate for wearing masks. Be leaders, okay? Be that person who's going to wear a mask right? all the time. 
Even if someone points a finger in your face or rolls their eyes from wearing a mask, don't matter. You got to be the leader and wear that mask. Um, and last but not least, um, for those interested in coming or applying to Texas Tech, uh, there again, our core values are what we live by each and every day. Okay. The family, collegiality, collaborativeness. If you're looking for that type of environment for your medical school training, you would love Texas Tech. And we will be able to prepare you not only for a residency, but we're able to also get you prepared to be competitive. I'll tell you this, as you guys in this audience know, step one has not become a pass fill examination. So we know that the emphasis is going to be step two. We've known this for a long time. We've, we didn't modify any of our clerkship clinical curriculum. That's how successful we've been. As of today, as of today, now this might change. We have 100% pass rate for step two average of a 250 and we're getting our students ready and prepared to apply to whatever residency from coast to coast from border to border so if you guys are interested in that type of learning environment we're here to help you out so there again thank y'all so much um, for those celebrating thanksgiving say stay safe enjoy your turkey tomorrow my wife is cooking my favorite pecan pie i can smell it coming through the office so thank y'all so much God bless everyone in Rock. Nothing but love. If you have questions, please don't be shy. And you guys all take care. Have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Morales. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank bye you. Bye. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Morales. We've been honored to have you.